Fuck you, it's Friday. Yes, folks, welcome back to FYIF, where the Templin Institute tries to stream a game while a truck backs up directly outside my window. I am Mark, the man behind the curtain, and tonight we're back in the Republic of Swordland for some suzerain. Yeah. Oh, man, I've missed this game. I didn't get to play it for as much as I would have liked last week due to, uh, <laughs> due to some internet issues. And man, what a week it's been since then. Putting out a lot of Godzilla videos. So I'm hoping this can be like a relaxing, casual stream where I just read things and don't have to worry about stuff. God willing, that'll be the case. So what happened last time? Uh, modernized the Swordish Air Force, which I'm pretty pleased about. Removed mandatory conscription, which I'm split on. I'm not sure if that was a good idea. Uh, what else? Kept healthcare and state control. And, oh, I reversed the ban on the Young Swords, which was all part of my plan, because I wanted to, uh... I had a whole idea that where I'd ban them, only to unban them to get the support of this guy. So that's, that's kind of my, where, where we're at. And, uh, yeah. Okay, so, let's just, uh, jump right into this. Kunarian saying, relaxing casual stream where you rule Swordland with an iron fist. That's the best way to do it, as far as I'm concerned. Alright, so what's in the news? World ignores the Blutish plight. <laughs> yep, I mean, I hate to see it, but what can I do? Valgish man shot after burning Agnolian flag. Okay, so the tensions around this island are still uh, flaring up. Understandable. What am I doing? A call from Marcel Caranti. That's the business guy, right? Caranti, Caranti. And living man. Thanks for following. Oops. Conrad. Yeah, actually, that's the son of the CEO. That's who that is. Okay, I got this. I was in my office looking through the agenda for the upcoming meeting at the Ministry of Economy. The meeting was going to be about the ownership of the Big Four, the four largest companies in Swordland. Part of Swordland, which is a multi-industry corporation, Bergia Steel, which I guess makes steel, the Swordish State Corporation, which does public works, and the Needham Mining Group. Okay. Some of these companies were controlled in part or entirely by the state. The others are mostly or completely privatized. I had the power to change that. Yes. Well, I know exactly what I'm going to do here. I hope uh, people like being nationalized, because that's what's going to happen. All right. The phone rang, and I put the agenda down. Pick up the phone. Greetings, Mr. President. I'm sorry to disturb you before such an important meeting, but I thought now would be a good time to talk about our arrangement. I'm sure you'll agree that the support I and my network have given your administration has been nothing but beneficial. Half of the non-state media in the country have been sharing positive news about you and downplaying negative events. Uh... <laughs> There's always more you could be doing for us. I like that idea. Mr. Rain, we essentially acquired the lack of times and have been coordinating media publishing across the three largest broadcasting organizations. Nobody in the entire country is supporting you as much as I am. I heard him knock on wood. On another note, I can't help but mention your tax hike, Mr. President. The increased taxes have made a substantial dent in the HOS's net profits. This has hurt the backbone of the Swordish economy. But I assure you, it's nothing we can't endure. Good. He paused for a few seconds. Out of goodwill, I will share a key piece of information. The Lotherberg Group has contingency plans if you decide to do anything rash that would disrupt their empires. You can't blame them, can you? Imagine someone trying to take your authority and personal wealth away without your consent. Uh, I don't see why we should be enemies. Exactly. If everyone plays their cards right, it will all be fine. Oh, I can't agree more. Now, let's talk about those cards. Since the start of your campaign, you've adamantly promoted a planned economy. Going by that, I am worried that you will attempt to nationalize Swordland's largest private corporations. 
Nationalization as a concept goes against everything my father built and stood for. If you do want to go down that road, I must insist on you excluding HOS from any such plan. That is my most important request. You may recall that one of the terms of our agreement was that I may ask you for one favor. Well, this is it. Uh, let's not give him any warning. Uh... I understand. I want our partnership to continue uninterrupted. I guess, like, I'm worried that I'm going to get locked into some sort of uh, choice here, but I think it would let me know if that was the case. So... Uh, this is kind of, like, hazy. Ah, oh, fuck it. I'll just say that. I understand. I want our partnership to continue uninterrupted, as do I. Always, I always keep my end of the bargain, Mr. President. Don't forget, you had better keep yours as well. He cleared his throat. Before we end the call, there is actually one more thing I would like to discuss. I will be blunt. Mr. Mr. Tusk is unfit to be the spokesman for the Lauderberg Group. His archaic thinking has only preserved a status quo that benefits himself and precious few others. It is high time something changed. I see where this is going. I want him gone. It is time the group had a proper leader. Me. Here is what I propose, a win-win situation. If you could use your powers to make Bergia Steel Tusk's main company state-owned, he would lose his considerable influence, which means I could take over. If I take over with your help, I'll be forever indebted to you and support you in all your goals, be they a re-election or something more. How does that sound? That sounds profitable to me. Deal. Perfect. Well then. I have taken up enough of your time today. This has been a productive call. Oh yes it has. Oh no, thank you Marcel. Great name by the way. Thanks Marcel. Talk to you later. After a couple of minutes I went back to reviewing the agenda. God, I hope I get to nationalism right away. Uh, nope. General Staff releases, uh, releases positive statements. The current president is a man of tradition. He is strong and he is decisive. I had worked with President Sol before. I know President Sol. He is my friend. And I know that he is proud of what President Anton has achieved. Damn straight. What else we got in the news? Protests continue against government intervention in Welland. Yeah, I don't love it. Welland Operation Aftermath continues. Oh boy. Lucian schedules some time with me to discuss the potential political repercussions of the upcoming economy meeting. He arrived on time, as usual, and took a seat right across from me. Good morning, Mr. President. Lucian had dark circles below his eyes. The plethora of political developments must have been weighing even on a workaholic like him. You look tired. Ah, uh, now nah, I'm going to be professional, aka kind of mean. Let's discuss the upcoming meeting. I booked some of your time to pre-plan for today's meeting at the Ministry of the Economy. We need to be cautious. Any grand plans about the economy also heavily influence our political standing. We would be changing our relationship with the old guard, the oligarchs, and the opposition. As you know, this meeting will give you the opportunity to alter the ownership of the Big Four, the largest corporations in all Sortland. Yes, I did know that. We can start the process of nationalization or privatization, or we can just keep the status quo. Again, I remind you that I need to change... Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I know what I'm doing. What are you leaning towards? We will nationalize these companies. I have to ask, why? What is your intention? I cannot allow a major part of the country to rule, run without my input as president. The oligarchs must submit to me. Yes, that is right, exactly. And... Beba Q, I want to say, thanks for following. It's true that the more control we have, the better. Your administration still bears responsibility if we let the oligarchs determine the course of the country. One thing to remember is that since you have been transparent about promoting a planned economy, nationalization will not cost us much support. Of course it won't. I received a report from the Ministry of Economy that may impact your decision. Unfortunately, we have missed our government budget targets for the current quarter. The plan to change the ownership of important assets could help us generate much needed resources to further improve economic development before the next election. It's just something to consider. We might be aiming for nationalization, but we need to remember that they can only that they only care about their own. Yeah, yeah, I get it. 
Yeah, we're not on good terms with them. That's yeah, I know. If our nationalization plan hurts their assets too much, we may end up at war with the men who control much of the economy. Oh, I have a plan for that. The oligarchs must be destroyed. Seizing their assets is the way to go. The only way to avoid being damaged by such a dramatic action is a swift surprise takeover. Some of my connections indicate that there seems to be a contest for leadership in the Lotherberg group. It looks like Marcel Karate is making moves to become the key figure. Karate probably wants his father's seat as the head of the group, and Tusk doesn't want to let go of it. It's a significant power struggle, considering that these are the heads of Swordland's two largest private corporations. Because we're going down the path of nationalization, we will handle the power, or we will have the power to tip the balance towards either side. Since you have already made the decision to nationalize, you need to be decisive in your follow-up actions. Did Marcel or Tusk contact you? I received a call from Marcel. What did he ask for? He wanted to make a deal to leave HOS untouched. And then? I said I'd think about it. Very well. Was that all he wanted? He also wants me to nationalize Burgia Steel to take down Tusk, as I expected. The internal conflict among the oligarchs puts us in an interesting position. Our relationship with Walter Tusk hasn't been good so far. Any move you make now has to be calculated and thought through. Lucien looked at his watch. Very well, then it's almost time. I will inform Mr. Hole of your decision, and he'll make the necessary preparations to formulate a plan. Excellent. I must get back to work. See you at the next meeting. Thank you for your time. God, I want to nationalize these bastards so badly. I hate him. I hate him, Jacques. All right. Swordish Contana joint drills at Conriat Naval Base. Unita Contana, having been granted access to Conriat Naval Base, has been running joint military drills with Swordish ships. The exercise is indicative of the deepening trust between our country and Unita Contana. Okay. Following the deal during which... Okay, yep, got it. Contana ships from Conriat seen together with Fog's Landian Navy. Yep, tensions keep rising. Got it. Okay. Ownership changes of major corporations. Here it is, folks. Lucien and I arrived at the Ministry of Economy. Assistants took our coats and showed us into the meeting room where Simon, Edith, Gus, and Mikhail were waiting. As soon as I entered, their chatter stopped and they stood up. After a few pleasantries, everyone but Simon took their seats. He opened his briefcase, produced a folder, and proceeded to go over some of the documents. Oh, and thanks to Kurama for following. Welcome to the party. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Ministry of Economy. Without further ado, we are here today to discuss our economic moves towards nationalization. Both Mikhail and Edith had their arms crossed and frowns on their faces. They were listening intently. Mr. President, before you arrived, certain individuals in this room were voicing their opinion against a nationalization plan. But as I understand it, your decision has already been made. Uh... Yes, and you'll respect my decision whether you like it or not. I don't want to get into a back and forth. But, but... One look from Simon stopped her. Both she and Mikhail were relentless in their seats. Or restless. Uh, let's move on to how we can go about implementing a nationalization plan. Mr. President, he handed me and everyone else in the room two neat stacks of documents. Please turn to page 14. Okay. The Heart of Swordland. The first corporation up for discussion is Heart of Swordland, led by fledgling CEO Marcel Conradi, or Conradi. HOS has recently observed a boost in the revenue. They control many media organizations across Swordland. It is possible to see their imprint everywhere, from newspaper, st uh, newspaper stands to convenience stores. In fact, they own more than half of the media products in the country. We all know how much of an effect media has on politics. Yes, we do. The, that is the reason I think if you were to nationalize any corporation, HOS should be our target. I must add that I myself am against fully nationalizing any of these companies in principle. Yeah, it doesn't matter what you think. I'm doing it. However, we could partially move the ownership of HOS to the state, gaining access to their income to help the recession and provide for our citizens. I am inclined to agree with you from a political perspective. However... If we are going to nationalize HOS, I think we should go all the way and move its ownership to the state. I already know what to do. Let's move on to the next option. Very well, turn to page 37. Bergia Steel. Largest private corporation, the big four, and therefore the largest in Swordland. 
It has been at the helm of steel manufacturing for many years. It is led by current CEO and Lotharberg spokesman Walter Tusk. I believe all of us in the room are familiar with him in one way or another. What can I say? They have been widely successful since their founding. They have achieved renown not only in Sorland, but worldwide. I believe we shouldn't attempt to break something that is already working. I am against the nationalization of Bergia Steel in any capacity. Not to mention any amount of nationalization would be disastrous for both Bergia Steel and Sorland. Well, we'll find out. Much of our steel trade is reliant on their manufacturing capabilities. Any sudden change, there would be... Okay, yeah, I don't believe you. No matter what, we should refrain from nationalizing them. It would result in an economic crisis. I don't have so strong of an opinion, but I will say that nationalizing both Bergia Steel and HOS would be quite unwise. I have already decided on what we need to do. Sounds good. Let's go over the documents once again, then. I read all of Simon's documents one, once more, then flipped to the last page. It was time to make some decisions. Oh, I'm afraid both your corporations will be nationalized by the time your friends arrive. Heart of Swordland, fully state-owned. Bergia Steel, fully state-owned. You are about to make changes in the ownership of prominent companies in Sorland. Are you sure about your decisions? Yes, I am. I signed the document, altering the ownership of the Big Four with a flourish. Simon leaned back in his chair. So, this is the path we are taking. This is absolutely ridiculous. Simon, please tell me you're not fine with this. Please tell me that Mr. President did not just sign this order. He just did, Mr. Avon. And there is nothing you can do about it. Mikhail turned to me. His eyes were open with rage. He was clenching his fist so hard that his hands turned red from exertion. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what? What have you done, you... Mikhail, don't, please. You idiot! Go back to your master like the dog you are and tell Mr. Tusk that you're through. What did you just say to... Mikhail! I am very sorry for my colleague's behavior, Mr. President. I hope we can look past this. I'm sure Mikhail is sorry too, right? I am sorry, Mr. President. I lost my cool. Stay silent. Come, Edith. We must report the outcome of this meeting. I am not going anywhere. Suit yourself. Thanks, Edith. And Mr. President, Mr. Tusk will hear about this. You can rest assured. He picked up his bag and started making his way to the entrance. Really, Mr. Tess is going to hear that I'm stealing his company? Wow, who can say? All right, Lucian got up from his seat and intercepted him on the way out. He put his hand on Mikhail's shoulder and spoke with a calm and soft voice. I'll be watching you. Damn, that's a cool one. Mikhail didn't respond. He simply left. Edith leaned forward to get closer to my ear. Mr. President, I've had my fair share of experience. I understand when the cards are stacked against me. I want to assure you, you will find an ally in me. It had better be that way, Edith, for your own good. <laughs> I understand. I must leave now as well. That'll be it for today, then. I know everyone has very busy schedules. So thank you all for coming. I want to see the results as soon as possible. Of course, as fast as we can. Hell yeah. What a day. What a, what a, what a lovely day this has been. Okay, illegal crossings from the Welland well border. BFF recruitment. Protest against local military presence. Yeah, yeah. Bugslandian Navy active in Marking and Sea. Okay, Unified Education Language Act. Uh, section 1 enforces the, the educational... Okay, so official language stuff. Ugh. As I recall, What's-His-Face wanted me to sign this, so I guess I'm going to sign this. I hate it, but I said I'm doing a Stalin run. Stalin push for Russification, so... God damn it. Alright, results of the economic direction. Oh, I think Tusk is going to be very upset. 
With the nationalization decisions made, all that was left was for Swordland's two most prominent oligarchs to sign the paperwork, and so I called them both to the palace conference room. Lucian showed Marcel Karate and Walter Teskin. They sat across the table from me, leaving one empty chair between them. The two oligarchs looked at each other and then at me. You are making a terrible mistake. To put it mildly, you can't just take away our entire life's work and expect no repercussions. This might be one of those rare moments where you are aligned, Marcel. Well, it's rare a president does anything this colossally stupid. Completely nationalizing Southern's two biggest private corporations. Are you insane? Stop whining. You are both done for. Mr. President, I beg you to rethink this decision. Lucian fanned the agreement papers out in front of them. Mr. Karate, Mr. Tusk, here are the agreements that pertain to the nationalization and the transfer of your shares to the state. He pointed to various sections and pages in the stack of papers. You will need to sign here, here, and here. I thought we had a deal! Walter scrutinized Marcel closely. Ooh, <laughs> I don't need your deal now that I have your company. Excellent. No, this can't be. Marcel buried his head in his hands. I had a gut feeling, President. I knew you were not to be trusted. I knew you would end up destroying everything Sorlin stood for. I should have destroyed you when I had the chance. I played you like a fiddle. Screw you. <laughs> Gentlemen, don't make this more difficult. Sign the papers. Marcel's shoulders slumped in defeat. I... I don't have a pen. Neither do I. Hand him your own pen. I handed him my own pen with a presidential sigil on it. There is no way out of this, is there? No. Walter sighed. Fine, I will sign it. In a painfully slow manner, he signed the documents. He handed my er, he handed my pen to Marcel. Marcel signed the papers. Now what? Give me back my pen. Marcel half-heartedly extended his arm across the table. The pen was still too far away to reach. Get up, come closer, and give me back my pen. God, this is a power move if there was one. <laughs> Marcel got up from his seat and gave me the pen. Uh, we will never forget what you have done to us. Your time will come too, Rain, believe me. I will be blunt. We will do everything we can to make sure you will never get a second term. Don't you realize how much dirt I have on you? You will pay for backstabbing me. I swear on my name is a karate. If we are going down, you are going down with us. Most of the assembly eats out of my hand. You will learn what it means to hurt Walter Tusk, President. Guards! Two guards immediately enter the room. Mr. President, we can't let them threaten you like this. Ooh. You are right, guards. Sometime an Antel Rock prison will teach them. Yeah, I like this a lot. <laughs> this is already way better than last time. And Master Thief Esquire, thank you very much for the bits. Two guards waiting outside entered the room immediately and started to apprehend Marcel Karate and Walter Tusk. No, 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 no! You can't do this to me! You malevolous pig! Dictator! Get your hands off me! Yeah, I told you this was going to be a dictator round. They should have known. You! I will destroy you! Good luck doing that behind bars! Cuffed by the two guards, Walter Tusk and Marcel Karate left the room. Ha ha ha! This is all going, uh, way better than last time. I love it. Police launch successful raids. Karate and Tusk arrested. A concerning show of presidential power or a case of just desserts? How about both? Corporate fat cats Walter Tusk and Marcel Karate have been arrested following a meeting with Anton Rain who had just announced the nationalization of their companies, Bergia Steel and Heart of Swordland. That corporations need more government oversight is indisputable, but a hostile takeover and a rash of potentially unlawful arrests is not the answer. We hope someone in Whole Sword will be able to rein, rein in and prevent such further power grabs. Karate and Tusk arrested. Dismaying news from Whole Sword. Sources say that Marcel Karate and Walter Tusk, two of Swordland's most prominent and powerful businessmen, have been arrested. The arrest may have been connected to the ill-advised nationalization of their companies, Bergia Steel and Heart of Sorland. 
The two men reportedly met with the president to finalize the nationalization process, after which Karate and Tusk were seen leaving the scene in handcuffs, escorted by presidential guards. Given these magnets' wealth and immense web of connections, we expect this to be sorted quickly, but it is a concerning sign of what President Reign is capable of. Oh, we haven't begun to see what I'm capable of. HOS nationalized. Yeah, it was. Bergia Steel nationalized. You're damn right. Oh, hey! And now we have the Assembly vote on the constitutional changes. God help me if I don't pass this. I'm going to be screwed. Okay. Sergey was driving me towards the Grand National Assembly for today's historic vote. It was a big day. I wondered whether my attempt at changing the Constitution would end any differently than Alfonso's. I looked out the window as the noise of the city diminished and saw that we were already inside the palace complex. The complex housed the buildings of all government branches in the center of Holsword. It was one of the biggest developments in Swordland. The Maroon Palace stood on a small hilltop surrounded by trees. We passed by the palace and entered the forest that separated it from the Grand National Assembly. We drove on the small road that wound through the forest. It was a warm day, so I rolled down the window. I could hear birds singing from the trees. I'm about to get assassinated. Are you okay back there, sir? I'm okay. Hey, Sergey, I'm okay. How are you doing? I'm as good as I can be, sir. Sergey made a left turn out the forest and entered the vast garden area of the assembly. Did you know that Mr. Tarkin's soul came to Holsword this morning? I heard some politicians talking about it today. Apparently, this is the first time he's come to the city in the last five years. I thought he left the mainland and lived on Duru Island, never to return back to politics. But they were saying he might be here to exercise his member of honor rights for the first time. Interesting. Um... That's great. Maybe I'll meet him. I'm sure you'll meet him, sir. If he's coming here after all, all these years, he would, be, he would pay the president his respects. Do you think he's here about today's vote? Yes, Sergey, most likely. Well, I'm sure he will support you, sir. We'll learn soon enough. Sergey drove inside the gates of the parkway and parked the car. We have arrived, sir. We'll talk later. See you, Sergey. Before you go, I want you to have this. My father had this pocket watch, and he said it protected him from the evil of the world. I want you to have it. He opened his hand and showed me a very old-looking pocket watch. It looked like it was made during the century of revolutions. I can't take this. It must be valuable to you. I insist. Very well. My father would be happy. I looked at the back of the watch. The year 1920 was engraved on it. I put it in my front pocket, gave my thanks to Sergey, and opened the card. That was really nice of him. Good luck with the vote. I walked up the white stone stairs of the Grand National Assembly. The entrance looked like a temple gate from the classical era. The door opened to reveal vast corridors of wood and white stone. I joined the crowd of people who were walking slowly towards the parliamentary hall. Suddenly, I noticed Lucian emerge from the crowd of packed politicians in front of me. He looked relieved when he saw me. Ah, sir, there you are. Have you seen Vice President Vectern? He's nowhere to be found. Um... I've just arrived. I have no idea. I hope Mr. Vectern arrives soon, too. At any rate, how about yourself? Are you ready to finally face the Assembly, sir? Lucian, I've just heard something worrying from Sergey. We'll address that later, sir. Come, we must go inside. Okay, you can't just, like, give me ten seconds? We followed the crowd into the parliamentary hall. After we were inside, Lucian and I separated to take our assigned seats. I went up to the mezzanine overlooking the hall and sat down. I waited as the MPs took their places inside the hall one by one. After a while, I saw Gloria walk to her elevated seat at the center of the hall. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. We will shortly begin with today's agenda of the USP's proposed changes to the Constitution of Swordland. After a short while, everyone was in their seats. According to the current Constitution, constitutional amendments require a two-thirds majority in order to reach Assembly approval. If the vote succeeds, the proposal will be sent to the Supreme Court. The proposal in question includes these points. Okay, blah 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 blah. 
Blah, 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 blah. Blah, 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 blah. I hereby invite all of you to vote. She struck her gavel down. The loud bang made some of the MPs jump up in shock as they woke from their deep sleep. As I previously stated, it will require a two-thirds majority in order to pass. You may now cast your votes. I felt the need to stand up and stretch. I looked down the hall from the platform I was seated on. Some assembly members immediately walked to the ballot box to cast their votes. Most of them, however, began to congregate in groups around the hall discussing the changes. Go down to the hall where all the MPs are. Yeah, there we are. As soon as I reached the bottom of the stairs, Caruso Kibbener approached me. Mr. President, how are you feeling about the vote? Very positive. Good to hear. I'm sure we'll get through this. I'll go vote now. See you afterwards. He abruptly turned away from me and walked towards his seat. Then I saw Lucian waving at me. He was among a group of people in the corner of the hall. I walked up to him. On my way, I bumped into Mansun Lek. Oh, blue descent. Okay. This guy's not going to like me. Mr. President, I'm sorry I didn't see you there. I wish you good luck with the vote. He gave me a cold stare. Excuse me. He straightened his tie and walked away. Oh, man. I finally reached Lucian. By now, deep in conversation with another member of our party, he excused himself and turned towards me. Sir, did you vote yet? We have to be quick. What's the rush? I'll explain on the way. I signed my vote and prepared the envelope. Together, Lucian and I walked to the center of the hall to cast our votes. He kept rushing me throughout the process. Gloria bowed her head slightly in respect as she saw us vote. Lucian pulled on my arm and whispered in my ear, Mr. President, we may have a problem. Tarquin Soul is here. Oh my god. I know. Hmm. You have to accelerate the voting process. We need everybody to vote as soon as possible. We don't know what he's capable of right now, but if assembly members see him, he might influence them against the proposal. What can he even do? You of all people know the strength of personality. <laughs> we must keep the assembly's attention focused on you and your reforms. Go and ask Gloria to speed up the voting. She banged the gavel several times. The sound echoed across the room. Ladies and gentlemen of the assembly, we will soon begin counting. Please cast your votes if you haven't already. The pace in the hall definitely increased. The groups dispersed and MPs began lining up at the ballot box. Suddenly, Lucian pulled me aside. Sir, what do we do? He pointed at the back of the assembly near one of the exits. I followed his finger to see Tarkin's soul sitting there. He looked much older than he had five years ago, but I could tell he had the same fire in him. Some MPs already gathered around him and were chattering in awe, okay. The assembly gradually went quiet as people started to notice Saul's presence in the hall. Leave him be, if that's what you wish. As I was talking to Lucian, I spotted Caruso Kibbener walking to the back of the hall towards Tarkin's soul. He bowed in front of Sol and gave him a military salute. Seeing this, more people started to approach him. Suddenly, Gloria came up behind us. Gentlemen, why don't you go back to your seat? Let's follow the procedure. Oh, by the way, we have 251 members here today. As you can see, the member of honor is here. He has already cast his vote. Has he? Now, so, Miss Tori, how many votes are missing? Only a few. Albin Clavin and three other men approached us with their envelopes in their hands, and these must be them. Good day to you, gentlemen, Madame Speaker. Good day, Mr. Clavin. I'm sorry to take so long, Mr. President. There was a friend who needed more clarification for his vote. He gestured at the men behind him. Let's get this over with, gentlemen. They went ahead and cast their votes. Let's win this, Mr. President. God, okay. I think I, I think we got this. He walked to his seat with a fist in the air. Now, why don't you two get back to your seats as well? Very well, we shall. We both went back to our seats. When I returned back to the mezzanine, I saw Pete sitting in the chair next to mine. Hey, where were you? I was right here, where were you? I was talking to Lucian. He looked at Gloria as she and her assistants counted the votes. The speaker's seat was only a few meters away from our platform. I really hope this proposal goes through. Soul is here. What? He's here to show everyone he's still alive. 
Uh, and Space Person saying in chat, I don't know if I want you to win, Mark. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> Fuck. He tried to get Gloria's attention by waving at her. How many votes left? Gloria looked at Pete. She looked annoyed. It's looking pretty good. 20 more votes to count. Pete turned to me. Thank God. We're gonna get this. Come on. Pete looked uneasy. And Johnny Hash, thanks for the uh, subs uh, for subscribing. Four months. Okay. I th <laughs> With that subscription, I think we can pass the uh, constitutional amendment because I think uh, Twitch subs do count towards Grant National Assembly votes, I assume. Pete pointed at where Caruso Kibner was sitting. Look at Caruso over there. I'm sure he was behind this mess. You shouldn't have trusted him. Hmm. It's not over yet, Pete. Don't jump to conclusions. Well... A single bang from Gloria's gavel reverberated across the hall. Everyone fell silent. The voting has been concluded. I leaned forward to hear the results. The proposal has 179 ayes and 72 nays. Thereby, the Grand National Assembly has surpassed a two-thirds majority and accepted the changes to the Constitution. There it is! Hell yeah! The proposal will be presented to the Supreme Court shortly for the final voting procedure. The Assembly roared with all kinds of different reactions. Yes! We did it! Hell yeah, we did! Suddenly, I noticed Tarkin's soul slowly rising from a seat at the back. He seemed to be struggling and used his cane for help. He stood and gazed around the hall as all the members of the Grand National Assembly went silent. Ah, uh, keep watching. He walked out the exit as two of his guards held the doors for him. And Monk Bank, thanks for following and for having an easy to pronounce name. That's always a plus. Thank God he didn't do anything. In any case, the proposal has passed the assembly, but now we have to think about the Supreme Court. Let's enjoy this victory for now. No, let's stay focused. Orzo Hawk will be a problem. Our best bet is to divide the old guard votes in uh, Garrisi. Or, no, our, okay, is Garrisi. He's the most corrupt person I've ever known. After I talked with Pete about the vote, we both left the hall to discuss our next steps. We waited for Sergei by the entrance. Constitutional changes passed by the assembly. There it is. Reigns, reforms, win over assembly. Kibiner congratulates president. Count is surprised. In spite of heavy opposition and a special appearance from old man Tarkin Sol himself, President Rain actually managed to get his constitutional reforms past the Assembly. We've been advocating for change to Sol's dusty constitution for years, although it's doubtful that the changes Rain is advocating are the same as those he have in mind. Even if Rain decided to come down on the side of democracy and fairness, getting a proposal like this past Gloria Tory's gavel must have required a great deal of compromise and getting approval for the Supreme Court will require even more. Well, that's what bribes are for. Meeting on the re results of the assembly vote. Lucy and Pete and I convened on the massive balcony of the palace. It was nice to catch a breeze in the increasing summer heat. Both had grins on their faces, but Pete's got larger as he kept recounting our success in the assembly. Fellas, the first obstacle has been cleared. Congratulations to all of us. Uh, we can celebrate once we get past the court. The president's right. The assembly was the easy part. Pete leaned on the balcony railing. What about Tarkin's soul? Did you see him again? As far as I know, he's still staying in Holsord, but hasn't cared to pay his respects to President Rain yet. What a jerk. What the hell is that all about, anyway? Him appearing out of nowhere. He came to the assembly to make a statement, but we still won the vote. I'm sorry that we failed to warn you he would be attending, Mr. President. We should have inf we should have been informed about his arrival. But Lucian said we apologize. That wasn't your fault, or maybe it was. I don't know. In a situation such as this, I would have expected Carl to report it to me, but it's no excuse. We should have done our research. 
What's done is done. Let's not linger in the past. You're right, sir. You must plan ahead now. Yeah, we have the first hurdle cleared, but now we have the council of grumpy old old men on our way, yeah. I have to say, that's a fitting description for the court, but unfortunately for us, they are more than that. They are our largest obstacle yet. Also, you're forgetting about Miss Edmonds. They are not all grumpy old men, okay. Hmm. The big trouble is their big daddy Hawker. We can't let him control the court against us. We surely cannot. We need to work with Mr. Garassi and Miss Ed L. Edmonds to undermine Orzo. Miss Morgna has been reluctant to help with the lobbying of the court, but she has accepted to at least try and convince the justices to organize a meeting with us. Which means our lobbying efforts have not yet borne fruit. It will be up to you and Miss Morgna, sir. Okay, and Nia was pretty adamant about her position against the proposal. That's already one vote lost out of seven. Yeah, okay. Hmm. Uh, I don't know if this is going to work, but I'm going to try. I don't know about that, Anton. You have to convince her yourself if you can. Not to make it sound more depressing, but it's not only about her. Let's not forget about Mr. Hawker and his loyalists. That's four of five votes gone right from the start. Yes, we'll need to reach out to the old guard and the moderates in order to reach six votes. There is not much leeway. Hmm. If the reformist judge justices are against us along with the old guard, how do we even get six votes? It's a tough spot to be in. As I said, we have no other way but to convince Mr. Hawker's fellow old guard members behind his back. We may need to take some extreme measures, though. Hey, we won the vote comfortably. I'm sure that counts for something. There is at least some pressure on the court now. The court still sees us as a threat. They will not be persuaded so easily. Huh. We never expected this to be easy, and nothing has changed. That's true, sir. In any case, we should start with our best bet. I already asked Nia to arrange a meeting with uh, Miss Edmonds. Okay. I don't like my chances here. Uh, okay, well, I mean, we'll see. What about Heron Garasi? He's refused to speak with us. He refused to speak with you, Pete, but if the president can have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with him, I'm sure he'll open up. Okay, look who's coming. It was Caruso Kibener. He slowly walked up to us with a smile on his face and spread his arms wide as he approached us. Here you are! The most dangerous men in the Maroon Palace. Afternoon, Mr. Kibener. Damn right we're dangerous. Lock up your daughters! Pete laughed. Caruso squinted into the bright sunlight. God damn, this sun. <laughs> he reached down to his pocket, pulled out a pair of sunglasses, and set them on his nose. Did you three figure out the court situation? Most of them have been resisting our efforts, but we're working on it. It's not looking good? Uh... To be honest, it's not. Let's help him. Maybe he'll offer to help me out here. I see. Well, I hope you do something about it. It's not like the justices are big fans of this administration. Anyway, I'll leave you three to whatever you were conspiring to before I came. The heat here is killing me. We should catch up soon. He walked back to the door and left the balcony. Look at him go, that man. I don't trust him. He wants to take credit for the new constitution. If it passes, that is. We don't need him anymore. <laughs> Damn right. Lucien looked back at his watch. I think it's time to conclude a little meeting, sir. Olivia's here. Pardon the interruption, gentlemen, but Mr. President, David Weesey is calling about the upcoming foreign policy meeting. Perfect timing. Tell him I'll be right there. I will, sir. She turned to leave the balcony, then back at us. Congratulations on the victory, on the victory, Mr. Rain, Peter. She looked Peter in the eyes as she said this and ignored Lucien's altogether. Pete's eyes followed her as she walked out. Getting pretty hot out here. Okay, let's call it finished. You may both go. All right, gentlemen. See you later. They both left. Okay, invitation to a movie premiere. 
Rumberg whistleblower arrives. Okay, that's important. Uh, let's deal with the whistleblower. A whistleblower from the Rumberg Security Bureau has escaped to Sorland through the crossing in Estord. Agent Chelston Hailstone has promised to reveal extremely sensitive information about the development of a weapons program. Yeah, okay. Grant asylum. Kibaner congratulates. Well, it's, yeah, okay, whatever. Swordlin accepts whistleblower. Who was Chelston Hailstone and what does he know? Okay, so we got the whistleblower. That's good. Whistleblower in safe house. Got it. All good news. Now I'm going to go see a movie. I had been invited to an exclusive preview of Alfred Kubrick's new film, The Morning Shall Come. Although I wasn't in much of a movie-going mood, it would have been unpresidential not to attend. With its massive budget and Kubrick's directorial cachet, this drama was set to be a milestone for Sordland's burgeoning film scene. Personally, though, I was just looking forward to spending some time with my family. It was a very hot and sunny day as Sergei drove us to the old capital. The film was to be screened in the historic cinema Engle del Olri, sure, the very first cinema in Swordland. I gazed at the vast plains between Holsord and Erlery as we drove on the H1. Sergei had maxed out the air conditioning to keep the Cadilla comfortable. Uh, Flying Fortress saying, I don't like the way Pete acts. He may become a problem later. I think you're absolutely right. Frank fidgeted with his tie as he stared at the window. Worried about the university exam, son? Since when do you care what's happening in my life? I've been busy lately, but I'll always have time for you. What an honor, your highness. Frank, don't talk to your father that way. He's been working so hard for this country. Ignore him and talk to Theanna. Uh, are you in a better mood than your brother? Deanna nodded happily. What about you, Papa? You won something, right? You should smile and keep doing your best even if you lose. Shut up, Deanna! You don't know anything. Uh, that's my girl. Thanks a lot. There's no option in this game to hit your children. Probably for the best, but not period appropriate. Okay. Everything is going to be wonderful from now on, isn't it, Monica? Now no more politics. You've been awfully quiet, Monica. Now the number two. Of course. Let's just focus on having a nice time at the movies. Monica folded her arms. We drove on in silence. Oh god, okay. Sergey rolled down the soundproof glass between us. Sir, we are about to enter Erleroy. We will be at the cinema in a few minutes. Erleroy? 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 Thank you, Sergey. I took a brief look outside as Sergey rolled the soundproof glass up again. I could see the many towers of Erlery walk, or rising over what was left of the old city walls. Sergei knocked on the glass and gestured forwards. We were at the main square of Erlery in the historic cinema Anglais. The cinema of angels is right in front of us. Is this the place? Yeah. It was an old Baroque-style corner building with walls that looked like marble from a distance. There were exquisite ornaments on each side of, a very, of every window. Okay. Sergei pulled the car to the entrance of the building, which was lit by vivid neon stripes in many colors. Uh, okay. On the wall next to the entrance, there were painted the words, Stop the Oppression of Bludes. Other graffiti next to it read, Stop the Genocide in Wellen and Axis of Evil. Smolak, Rain, Lancia. Oh, man. Come on, let's get out. Sergei opened the doors, and we exited onto the red carpet. We were just about to enter the building when a journalist managed to block the path. Mr. President! Mr. President! Your constitutional reforms made it through the Assembly. How do you feel about their chances with the Supreme Court? I trust the justices will make the right decision. Thank you, Mr. President. Are you aware that Tarkin Sol will be present at the proceedings? Of course I was. Before she could ask anything else, the guards ushered us inside the theater. In contrast with the cinema's Baroque-style exterior, the inside was modern and sleek, with bare walls painted in black, red, and white. The film's cast and crew were already in the foyer, with glasses of champagne in their hands. We approached the crowd and were welcomed by the producers and the event organizers. A man walked up to us with quick steps. Madame, Mr. President, it's so good to see you here. 
He gently bowed at Monica and shook our hands. It's an honor to meet you. I am Alfred Krubbuck. The honor is mine, Mr. Krubbuck. I'm a big fan of your work. Frank snorted. I glanced at them and innocently took a sip. Okay, yeah, whatever. It's very humbling to know that you've been watching and enjoying my movies. If you don't mind my asking, which one was your favorite? This one may be slightly different from my previous works. Um, I loved The Sword of Dream. Oh, really? Then you might enjoy this one, too. I'll admit, I didn't expect you to be such a cinephile. Frank looked me in the eye and struggled not to laugh. Why don't we take our seats? It's about to start. We entered the screening room, the lights dimmed, and the film began. It was a period drama set in the 1870s about a swordish soldier who pursues a doomed romance with a widowed Blutish farmer during the conquest of Bergia. I wondered briefly whether Krubrick was commenting on my own treatment of the Blutish people, but then he had finished filming long before I became president. As the credits rolled, I made an early exit to use the men's room. I was washing my hands when I heard an unmistakable voice behind me. Tarkin Soul. So, what did you think? Tarkin Soul leaning on his cane. He, just, he had the same frail appearance I'd noticed at the assembly meeting, yet up close I could still sense the raw magnetism that had kept him in power for 20 years. I found the plot questionable, but it certainly looked spectacular. What about yourself? Sentimental pablum from the enjoyment of housewives only, and for a period piece, the script contained far too many anachronisms. Indubitably, or totes. <laughs> Indubitably! What the hell were you doing at the assembly vote, Mr. Soul? My country was about to make a rash decision. I simply couldn't sit by. It's not your country anymore. I suppose it isn't. Soul fixed me with a piercing stare. His back straightened. Perhaps my clout with the Assembly isn't what it used to be, but you may yet encounter difficulties pushing your reforms to the Supreme Court. A true president knows when he must step down. A lesson you'd be wise to learn yourself. I will not have my party and my constitution tarnished by a tyrant. You, calling me a tyrant of all people. You tarnished it enough for both of us already. I like that. Ha! Some of his spittle landed on my cheek. As if you, Anton Rain, are above it all. As if you're capable of re remaining president without getting your hands dirty. I am. You have no idea what it takes to do this job, boy, but you'll find out soon enough. He slipped past me and out the door. Oh, man. Soul security staff and mine were now clustered outside the washroom, forming a buffer against the large crowd that had gathered. That's talking Soul! I heard someone scream. His guards closed around him and mine around me. By the time the chaos subsided, I was back in the car with my family, and Soul was long gone. Yeah, fuck that guy. Rain and Soul meet at Kubrick screening. New law on education and the Swordish language. New language bill, a milestone for integration. That, I don't know about that. Washroom summit, what are Rain and Soul hiding? Rain signs, racist bill, great. Ludish students drop school in protest. Okay, well. Bill signed protest in Bergia. Dinner with the family at home, briefing on diplomatic strategy. Let's do this religious thing. Ceremonial duty for the day of dissension. Morning haze surrounded the city of Dare as the sun dawned on the day of dissension, the holiest day of the nerdy religion. It celebrated the first message received from God by St. Dast and his 30 disciples. As per tradition, the celebration was held inside the Arch Sanctuary of Discerned whatever. This year, however, for the first time ever, it was going to be televised. That was Lucian's idea, as he saw it, granting the people a rare glimpse of the grand ceremony, and showing them how seriously their president took this holy event would ease any tensions that lingered in the region. 
And so we arrived at the largest cathedral in Sorland. A huge crowd gathered around our convoy as our car pulled up to the entrance. This will work out well, trust me, sir. Of course, that's only if the prayer is done correct or completely correctly. Please don't forget the order. Yeah, whatever, it's fine. Pretty straightforward, yeah. Sure. Very good. You will have to go first, I will come inside later, and we will meet up after your part is done. Exit the car. I exited the car, and I was greeted by a chorus of cheers and camera flashes. I waved to the people as I made my way to the Grand Gates. The Arch Sanctuary was a sight to see with its towering visage. It cast a shadow over a large portion of the city. I had to crane my neck to see the narrow spires at the top. Just standing next to it made me feel awe and dread in equal measure. As I reached the gates, I spotted my wel welcoming committee. The Arch Priest and his disciples were waiting for my arrival. At my approach, they all bowed their heads in respect. The Arch Priest gave me an infectious smile as he straightened back up. Tall and handsome in his mid-fifties, he was one of the youngest and most popular archpriests in history. Some of his more avid followers even likened him to St. Dast. Okay. Mr. President, praise God! It is a blessing to see you on our most holy day again. Welcome, welcome. Archpriest? The crowd was still cheering loudly. The archpriest turned and raised both of his hands, and everyone immediately fell silent. Okay. Oh, great people of Swordland, once again we are gathered here to honor the Day of Ascension. I am indescribably happy to be sharing this moment with you as well as every blue and sword, old and young, tuning into their television to watch this holy commemoration. Along with the leader of our great nation, I say, let the holy day begin. Stray far from evil, O oh sons and daughters, for evil hides itself under many disguises. Disguise, okay, whatever the fuck, out of you really just bastard. Shall we move inside for your confession? Sure, let's get this over with. Most excellent. Right this way, we're going to a thing. Anton Rain, speak, speak, and confess now before the one God, and may he repent your sins on the most holy day of dissension. I confess nothing? I haven't sinned. Any man sins, we must all come to terms with it. This is your chance to repent. Please repent, Mr. President, and you shall be freed of the burden of your sins if you beg for forgiveness from God. I do not beg, Archpriest. Pride is the most dangerous vice of all. Perhaps you will come to this realization at one point in your life. The sliding window closed, and the Archpriest entered the confession chamber. Let's move on to my quarters before the ceremony. Take a seat. Are you ready for the ceremony? Yes, let's get on with it. Patience is a virtue, Mr. President. He leaned back in his chair comfortably. Does this guy have anything, like, interesting to say? So far, it's just, like, boring platitudes and pablum. I wanted to talk to you about something. I heard you decided on a new school curriculum, and decided that creationism shall no longer be taught in Swordland schools. Neither yeah, you're outraged, you religious asshole. I did not ask for your opinion. Yes, that is precisely why I... A couple knocks were heard on the door, and a young boy came in. He bowed before the archpriest, then me, before letting us know that the ceremony was about to begin. Okay, whatever. Uh, I didn't read over the instructions at all. I'm just gonna wing it. I got up and proceeded to my designated spot next to Lucy, and he leaned over and whispered in my ear. Unfortunately, that was not quite correct, sir. Ah, who gives a shit? My eyes met the, archpri the archpriest's, and he very slightly shook his head. The ceremony went on for another hour and a half. Finally, the noon bells chimed, marking the end of the cathedral service. We left to greet the waiting crowd. Uh, as I walked outside, I heard scattered boos. A man in a workers' party of Blutia shirt shouted that I was only here for the show, that I couldn't even bother to get the ceremony right. Others yelled in agreement. We should go before things get heated. <laughs> we entered our cars and drove back to our suites in Dare. I wonder if that made the news. Blasphemy or incompetence? Unbelievable! Let alone leading a country, President Rain is not even able to lead a religious ceremony right. 
As part of the Day of Dissension ceremonies, Mr. Rain was in the Arch Sanctuary of Dare. Just like many before him, all presidents of Swordland are required to perform the Holy Rites. Oh, really? The Radical cares about religious purity? You were on my side when I outlawed creationism, so what the hell? All right, so now we got dinner with the family. I arrived home from work, hung my jacket up, and put my briefcase in the hall. I paused, awaiting my usual greeting from my wife and daughter. Deanna was out at one of her after-school art classes, I remembered. But where was Monica? From the living room, I heard a muffled sob. Oh my god. I entered to find Monica sitting on the sofa, a letter in her hands, and a look of despair on her face. Sit down next to Monica. Monica briefly rested her head on my shoulder, then handed me the letter. It's from the Department of Education. Frank's university exam results are in. He failed, didn't he? Just read the letter. I looked at the page. Below Frank's name and address, his score was written. 435 points out of a total of 1,000. Oh, man. At the bottom of the letter, the word failed was stamped in red. All those years of effort, all those private lessons, all down the drain. He brought this upon himself. This isn't just about Frank, you know. Him failing will reflect badly on you, on us. I just don't understand. Frank's a smart boy. Why would he sabotage himself like this? I heard a key turning in the front door. Frank stomped in and was about to go straight upstairs when he noticed both of us in the living room. Mom? Dad? What's going on? Have a seat, Frank. He took a seat across from us, and I handed him the letter. He started reading it. Oh, shit. That's all you have to say? I need a moment. He went back to the kitchen sink and washed his face. A moment later, he came back. I never thought this would happen. I'm so sorry. It's my fault. I should have been around to help you study. Right. You should have taken a break from running the country to help your loser son. Frank looked close to tears. Monica put her hand on his shoulder. It's going to be okay, but you really should have studied harder, Frank. I know. So what am I supposed to do now? Well, there's always military school, but you're the president's son. You still have options. Yes. Monica surprised me with her enthusiasm. If Alfonso could get his dimwit son into King's Hall University, I'm sure Holsword State would have room for a bright boy like Frank. I am not going to take life lessons from Ewald Alfonso. No, I won't influence your life. You've got to live with what you've done. I understand principles are important, but Anton, which is more important, your principles or your son's future? Shit. My principles. I knew it. <laughs> if it's so important to you, I'll go to goddamn military school. I won't be around to disgrace you any further. Frank, wait! Frank ran upstairs to his room. I'm going upstairs after him. Leave him be, he needs time. I suppose I need some time as well. Monica left the living room, and I started reading newspapers before dinner. Okay, well, that didn't go great. Court strikes down Urson v. Sordland. Yeah, well, to be expected. Ashraf anniversary, okay. Enough with the bloodish protests! <laughs> Okay. Justice failed once again. Yeah, I know it did, but the Bloods make a good scapegoat, so what am I supposed to do? I wish this railway would hurry the hell up. Okay, a briefing on diplomatic strategy. The doors to the White Room, like everything else in the Maroon Palace's main nerve center, were painted white. I took a deep breath before pushing them open. Time for yet another meeting. At least this time, it was with people who liked me. <laughs> the attendees rose up for their seats. Mr. President. Yosef nodded. He and Lucien sat down, while David remained standing. Now that you are here, let's talk about our diplomatic strategy. He cleared his throat. Mr. President, if I may, I would like to provide you with a short overview of where we are at right now. 
Nod and gesture. Okay. Although we did not make a trade deal with Agnolia, we succeeded in making one with Wellen, which means we have increased our presence in the region. These deals are important pieces of leverage and significant first steps into the global arena. We must now look towards the future. It's time to take the big steps. Precisely. David sat down, pulled out a few papers, and started going through them as he kept talking. Wellen and Ignolia were practice runs. We must begin improving our relationship with greater nations. We need to elevate our international standing, especially with the threat of Rumberg looming. Yosef cleared his throat. Thanks to your wise investment, Swordland's army is on its way to becoming a force to be reckoned with. Whether it's Rumberg or anyone else, we can handle outside threats just fine. We don't need to beg for help from anyone. Thank you for your input. I will consider it. A military perspective is important, but these deals are about more than just gaining allies. We also need to consider the benefits to our economy such deals will provide, especially when we are still struggling to end the recession. David took a seat and brought out two stacks of documents. At the start of our term, I had a comprehensive trade plan laid out. Following the visits to Wellen and Agnolia, we were to pursue potential trade deals with two greater nations. Bog's Land is one of them. Hmm. If we can manage to get them to the table, there is much more potential here than in Wellen or Agnolia. Because they are one of the most important countries in CSP, a deal with Vagas Land is a ticket to bring Sorland closer to the United Continent Sphere. It would also strengthen our voter base, since they're expecting us to follow through on our promises to lean eastwards. Indeed, this trade deal could also be the first step in allying ourselves with Vagas Land, or maybe even entering CSP. Yeah, Yosef's not going to be a fan of that. We should do whatever we can to get them on our side. I agree, Vagas Land is certainly powerful enough to deter Rumberg. Moving on to Lesbia. Our southern neighbor is rather sore over our decision to accept financial aid from United Contana, allowing its ships to dock at our naval base in return. Yeah. Uh, granting those docking rights essentially gave United Contana a foothold in eastern Mercopa. It's no wonder ATO felt threatened by this move. In any case, a deal won't be happening with Lesbia, that is for sure. Good. We will never make a deal with a country in ATO. All right, that's it. As to the actual contents of the trade deal, the investment we have done in the Loren region has yielded positive results. Oh, good. It's Lucian. Okay, looking at my stats here, the investment helped increase the coal output of the region. We now have a surplus, which makes an excellent resource for trade. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. I need to know your decision before we can proceed. What should we do? Do what? Oh, uh... Begin negotiations with Vagsland. Excellent news. I will begin at once. That was all I had for today. Thank you for coming. Oh, that's a shame. I would have liked to have tried to at least get something going with Lesbia. But it makes sense that they hate us because of the whole supporting those guys thing we did. Alright, what do we got? Isolated polio cases. Polio cases explode. Rain to visit Vagas land. Unemployment greatly reduced. That's good. I think we went up from 2 to 3 in economic development, so that's pretty good. Recession hits workers. Trades going on. Okay, whatever. Currency loses value against Arcasian Lyra. Okay. Dinner with Justice Isabel. Okay... Is she on my side? I cannot remember. Isabel, Isabel, Isabel. I mean, okay, I guess we'll just find out. Nia Morgna had arranged a dinner with Justice Isabel Edmonds this evening. Ahead of the dinner, Nia and I uh, met to talk. We settled on a table on the second floor of Le Pelion, a world-class lesbian restaurant in downtown sword. The whole floor is reserved for us. Uh, 
Yeah, okay. And the music coming from downstairs was enough to guard our voices from potential eavesdroppers. I still can't believe Sol came to the boat. I'm sure he also pressured the justices of the court against your proposal right after that win. I hate to be on his side, but I don't agree with your proposal either. You call this proposal democratic, but we know it's a power grab, Mr. President. I'm only doing this out of respect. I've organized this meeting because I am still part of the cabinet. Consider this a favor from my side. Thank you, Miss Morgna. This means a lot. It should, Mr. President. I'm aiding you against what I believe in. Of course, that won't stop me from doing what I can to make it fail. But anyway, let me know if there's something else. I'd be talking, or I'd, I'd be taking my leave as soon as Miss Edmonds gets here. Master Thief Esquire saying, get out your checkbook. This is going to get expensive. I don't think bribery is going to work on her. I mean, we'll, we'll see, but, uh... And Marito, subscribing for 34 months. Thank you very much. I... She's also skeptical. Okay, so she's skeptical, but doesn't like the old guard. What's the atmosphere in the court? Most justices don't really talk when I'm around. They don't trust me as I'm outside my... Okay, yeah. I don't think she can... Uh, what about Heron? Lucian and Pete believes that he can be persuaded too. Whatever you do, I'm not with you. What is Orzovan doing? He is doing his best to organize the court against a proposal. Their weakest link is Heron, but the rest are unbreakable. Nobody is unbreakable. You are right, but where is the breaking point? These old men have a pride as vast as Mercopa. They're not easy to break. And this is not a game, Mr. President. There's nothing else. Okay. I mean, this is going to be tough. Uh, did you decide on an entree? I mean, it's all going to come down to this, right? Whatever I pick for dinner, that's just going to decide whether this passes. Uh, uh, we have a guest coming. We'll wait for her to order. He went downstairs again. Mr. President, I know it's too late, but you are making a mistake. You've sent our opportunity. Okay, I don't care. Suddenly, I noticed Justice Isabel Edmonds coming upstairs. Okay, she was wearing a plain dark gray dress that hid most of her features. Is that good or bad? Okay, good to see Miss Edmonds. Nia got up from her chair to shake Isabel's hand. Stand up for a handshake. Uh, yeah. Huh, okay, I'm just trying to think of, like, how the hell I'm going to do this. Okay. Mr. President, good to see you. Good to see you, Justice Edmonds. How was your day, Miss Edmonds? Okay. I would normally say good, but this time I'll take the liberty to say that it was insanely exhausting. Heavy court matters again, not that I'm complaining. Oh, I know that feeling. But now that you are here, I will take my leave. I have business to take care of. Have a nice evening, Mr. President, Miss Edmonds. Okay. Hmm. <sighs> Suddenly, the waiter approached us. Are you ready to give the orders? Uh, Miss Edmonds, I'll let her order first. Maybe that'll like win her over, I guess. I'll have the salad. Thank you. Of course, and you, sir. Uh, I'll have the silent too. I'll just copy her. Perfect. He quickly took a couple of notes in his tiny notebook. I'll be back shortly. Okay, I am freaking out, but I think I can do this. <sighs> okay. Um, let's get to the point, shall we? As you wish, Mr. President. She moved herself on the chair to be more comfortable. First of all, I want to congratulate you on the successful vote in the Grand National Assembly. Uh, Master Thief Esquire with 100 bits saying, Paris is worth a mass, Constitution 
is worth a salad. <laughs> but it pains me to say that your proposal has a very low chance of getting through the Supreme Court. Okay. And what do you think about the proposal itself? To start with, I think it's disrespectful. You are packaging it as a democratic reform, yet it smells like an attack against the Supreme Court. You know it's true, Mr. President. You are aiming to destroy the court, and you need us to do so. Why should I vote for a proposal that will take away my immunity as justice? Was this the promised reform, removing justices however you see fit? Okay. You are expanding the powers of the president, which already is very powerful. Okay. Um... We both know that the old guard that dominates and obstructs the court needs to be dealt with. We need a proper balance of power. What about the powers? Okay, um... I don't want to threaten the old guard, because she hasn't openly attacked them. She seems to be kind of hedging her bets. And I don't want to, like, be like, well, what about your power? Because that's just going to antagonize her. I'm going to do... We need a proper balance of power, Miss Edmonds. Try to see the bigger picture. Proper, you are already trying to take our right to vote on constitutional legislature and also open a way to impeach us, are you not? She sighed. At that moment, the waiter came back from downstairs, carrying plates of food. After seeing that we were in the midst of a discussion, he averted his eyes as he approached us. He quickly started serving the food and refilled our glasses. Okay, I got my salad. Bon appetit. Eating salad. The food here was insanely delicious, that's good to know. Tell me, Mr. President, what are your real intentions? Hmm. I mean, part of my agenda was that I would always just say I'm supporting democracy, so I guess I'm going to do that. We need a better democracy. That's all I'm striving for. Better democracy by eliminating the justices whenever you want, by binding the courts to the assembly to do their bidding. Why did you include that in the proposal, knowing that you need our vote? That's a good question. Uh, I had to take my chances. That seems sounds too weak. Um, I thought that I want to play up the division, but not. Uh, it's between one and two. I thought you would agree to that. I believe that the respectable justices like you are against the old guard. I, uh, yeah, I'll do that one. Uh, look, I am in opposition to them and definitely stand against their dominance, but this is not the way. But let's say this proposal goes through. Aha, she's coming around. What will be your next move? Um, hmm. To ensure the new processes are respected and executed in transparency. Yeah, that's it, exactly. That's the exact opposite of what I want to do. And Kaiser Lucas, thanks for following. I see. <clears throat> okay. Um. Miss Edmonds, please help us achieve this victory. We have to be together in this. That seems fair enough. Perhaps that is the way we must take. Ah, uh, yeah! She's coming around to all my goddamn lies. <laughs> okay. Um, can you explain me one thing? How come you think that the Supreme Court's right to vote on constitutional amendments is a major problem with such priority? Um, why don't you ask? No, that's too antagonistic. The court has been stopping every constitutional change. No, that's just, no. Uh, number three, number three is the clear answer. The judiciary should not have legislative powers. I, I think that's actually right, too. Um, so that is your position, I see. I don't know what to say, Mr. President. These changes are one thing, but there is also your political view. I don't want to hand a victory to uh, Milanivist. Yeah, that's, that's going to be a tough one. I could just lie. I don't agree with that. I am no millennialist. 
So you're no fan of Melenev? Who cares if you're into Chancellor Helgo's Vagslanian socialism or sort of socialism of Bernard Circas? It's all Carlos Marcio's socioeconomics in the end. You're playing with fire, Mr. President. She let out a sigh. Anyways, there is no point in discussing this with you at this moment. Okay. I want the old guard gone as much as you, but I am torn about this proposal. Okay. Uh... There is not much to think. No, that's insulting. We need your help. That's begging. Don't be. I'm gonna like. I'm gonna play as if she's already in my camp. Don't be. We're together in this, Mr. President. I am also wondering if you were in Sol's position, how would you have structured the Supreme Court? What do you even believe is its role? That's a good question. Um. It must have the power of judicial review and to strike down laws. Yes. Uh. Yeah. Like, in theory, this is correct. So I'm just going to say that. So what do you think about the judicial review? It plays an essential role in ensuring that each brand of government... Usually the longest answer is the right one. <laughs> Yes, recognize the... Yeah, that's what I want. Okay. Precisely. I'm glad that we agree on that. Isabel went on to finish the remaining of her salad. I still have great concerns about making every president a member of honor. That title was created for Solon to protect himself, not only dangerous. This will also be a huge burden on the government to take care of every ex-president's lavish lifestyles. Hmm. I mean, that's a good point. Um... <sighs> I like this one because it's like, well, I'm not going to be president forever when I actually am going to try to. <laughs> and thanks to Renan Geo for following. Yes, Swordland definitely gives presidents paranoia. She took a sip from her glass. I'll stay silent. She's, she's thinking about this on her own. Ah, oh, what? I regret to say I do not see eye to eye with you, Mr. President. I don't think I can support this proposal. Ah, uh, damn it. That's very sad to hear. Is there any way to change your mind? I don't think so, Mr. President. In fact, it's time that I leave. God damn it. Thank you for coming. Son of a bitch. I thought I had that one. She she seemed like she was coming over to it. The Supreme Court's gonna kick my ass. Okay, now we gotta reach out to Justice Heron. Uh I'll offer a bribe. private meeting with Justice Heron. It was yet another sunny day, and I was facing another important political figure, Heron Garassi. The bribe had worked, and he agreed to have a meeting with me just before the court vote. We scheduled to meet outside of Whole Sword, the Gentleman's Club of Pete and Ellery. Okay, whatever. I grabbed a drink and sat down on the balcony of the villa overlooking its vast garden. Heron sat next to me in his beige checked suit and took off his white trilby. Very nice location you've set up here, Mr. President. A gentleman's club, huh? We thought this place would be fitting. Yes, fitting. He straightened himself. So, Mr. President, you went a long way to make this meeting possible. I had to pay you the respect. Please do speak of your intentions and how I could be of assistance to you. We need your help with the upcoming vote. I am prepared to do that, as long as we help each other. He puffed himself up. I can help you beyond this vote. Wouldn't you want to have a Chief Justice, a chief justice who's, who'd be sympathetic to your concerns? Doesn't it sound nice? 
You're right, it does sound rather nice. Well, I agree. I already have reasonable support behind me. If Orso is dismissed from the court, I can take his place and keep helping you. We must think beyond the vote, Mr. President. Promise me that you'll dismiss him from the Supreme Court and him only. And I'll support you not only with this vote, but afterwards. I like the offer. It's a deal. Great to have come to an understanding. But I can now safely say that I'll do my best to have your proposal pass the court, Mr. President. He put his hat back on. Looking forward to our cooperation. We shook hands and he left me alone with his thoughts. Okay. Well, that's some... Is, is it enough, though? I don't think so. Ah, oh, man. Announcement of the Supreme Court's decision. This is going to kill me. Ah, oh, this sucks. I'm nervous about... Oh, okay, well, I got no choice. Come on, come on, come on. Back at the office, I was eagerly waiting for the decision of the Supreme Court regarding our change to the Constitution. I stood up from my chair and looked out the window. Pete was with me, slouching on the couch on the right side of the office and staring at the ceiling. The whole process had been tough on all of us, but now there was nothing left to do but wait for the justices to cast their vote. What do you think, Anton? Are we going to make history today? To be honest, I have a bad feeling about this. So you trust Isabel to bring the votes? I don't know. We have to vote hope for the best. Oh, god damn it. But I guess the important person in all this is Heron. But anyway, we'll end up with a vote soon enough. The session must have started already. What time is it? Oh, god. I... Ugh. Anton? Pete slowly turned his head from where he was slouching to see the clock. Yeah, we have about ten minutes. He looked worried. Maybe you shouldn't have pushed the court so much. Taking away their immunity was a bit too aggressive. I wouldn't blame them if they voted no. I had to do it, Pete. Did you, though? Anyway. God damn it, Pete, you're killing me here. I don't know if you've noticed, but Kiriso has been very popular in the Assembly as of late. Our party's been supporting him on a lot of bills, some of which have already reached you. What do you make of this? I think he's a very dangerous man, Anton. We can't let him divide our party. I agree. You have to watch him closely. This music is killing me. His party only holds 40 seats, Anton, and he manages to pass bills. Maybe we shouldn't allow our party to be so generous with what they support. Suddenly, Livia entered the room. In her hands was a large object wrapped in straw paper. Good day to you, Mr. President. Am I interrupting anything? Yes, you are. What the hell is it? The Chief Justice sent you this. Thank you, Livia. You can leave it on my table. Yes, sir. She walked up to the table and gave it to me. I immediately started to remove the wrapping paper to reveal a framed photograph. Okay, victory is close. Blah, 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 blah. I turned to Livia. Thanks, Livia. You may go now. Yeah, okay. Uh, I gotta get to the goddamn decision. This must be some kind of a message. Victory will be close, huh? Orso is getting ahead of himself. Suddenly, Lucy rushed into the room. Mr. President, the vote has been concluded. God help me, it's not gonna work. Fuck! Unfortunately, sir, the constitutional changes have been rejected. Only two of the justices voted for a proposal. What? No! Damn old guard, we failed. God damn it, what do we do now? I'll talk to the cabinet and arrange a meeting immediately. We have to plan our next steps. This failure will not reflect well with the public or the assembly. God damn. Arrange the meeting immediately. Right away, sir. All of us immediately got to the work to plan our next steps after a Supreme Court failure. Fuck. Being a dictator is hard. The Supreme Court rejects constitutional changes. Supreme Court stands against change. Supreme Court votes against... Okay, god damn it. That sucks. Fuck, fuck, fuck. What a nightmare. Ah... Uh. Lucian stood upright, holding a large folder of files under his arm. He bowed in acknowledgement. He looked exhausted. Er, yeah. The cabinet is gathered in the White Room, sir. The Vice President will be opening the session soon. We can go in whenever you're ready. I'm ready. Let's go. Of course, sir. Lucian held the door for me, and we both left the office for the White Room. When we entered the room, Pete was speaking to the cabinet members who were already seated around the table. As soon as they noticed me, they all stood up. Say nothing and watch the room. 
and here's our president. He held up my chair for me to sit down and smiled. Please. When I sat down, everyone immediately took their seats. Let Pete talk. Ladies and gentlemen, we are here to discuss our current status and plan the remaining of our term. I know that some of you had your concerns about our style of governance so far. There will be time to speak up about these in the meeting today. But I must also thank you for all your hard work so far. We are very lucky to have a team like this. All of you have been invaluable to this administration. Nia and Kiara grimaced at his remarks. Having said that, we have now reached a critical point of our term. We are nearing the end. God damn it, what a fucked up way to go. We have worked long and hard, but we couldn't reform the Swordish Constitution. The Supreme Court blocked us once again. Unfortunately, some people within our team also worked towards this goal. The cabinet members started looking at each other and eventually set their eyes on Nia. Watch the room. Isabel and the other justices lenient to her legal opinion did not support us. He paused and looked around the room. But the past is the past, we must now look towards our future. We are investigating and analyzing our faults, we'll be taking measures accordingly. He glanced at both Lucian and me. Our party still remains divided. In order to look to the future, we need to make some changes. God damn it. On the other hand, the opposition is exploiting our failure to reform. The latest polls show a, a steep increase in, our, in the opposition's... Ah, oh, god damn, we're fucked. With the latest developments, we have seen a decrease in our popularity. The public opinion has shrunk since we took office. A major concern of the people is the state of our economy. We are slowly slipping into, into a depression. This will have dire consequences for our administration. We mustn't lose hope and give it our best. Sorlin needs us more than ever. Pete turned to me. I'll give the word to the president now. Thank you, Pete. Everyone's eyes are focused on me. First, I want to talk about new focus and some of my plans forward. God damn it. The state of our economy is very concerning. Uh... We need to become an economic powerhouse. If there are no comments, let's move on. Okay, what's going on? Our GDP has shrunk by 3%. God damn. So it's looking bad. Everything's gone bad. What about our trade deal with Welland increased our agricultural exports from the Bergia region? Our farmers are still suffering. Okay, whatever. State facilities. Man, the dictator run is not going very well. In fact, it kind of seems to have failed <laughs> immediately. Okay. So there's smallpox. The Ministry of Defense has a very important report regarding our situation with Rumberg. The investigation showed that Rumberg was, in fact, weaponizing rebels against our state. We have learned that they have been aiding the Blutish rebels in Welland, too. This isn't news. Our military must stand ready for any possible attack coming from Rumberg. We have gathered intelligence regarding their military research and production. They are building a massive army. We urgently need to increase our own military production. We cannot let them threaten us like this. Make the necessary arrangements. Of course. Mr. President, Stallport has agreed to begin negotiations. We will be moving on with that very soon. Okay, blah, 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 blah. Thank you, Mr. Weezy. Education, doing stuff, new curriculum, Mr. President. There is an important report from our intelligence officers. Okay, blue to freedom front shit going on, fine. Uh, you want to transfer the agenda Marie under the Ministry of the Interior. Uh, I don't see Yosef accepting this. Well, he just might have to agree with the President of Swordland tells him to. Uh, I disagree with this. I'm not so sure how this would help. I can't make that promise. Hell no. That is unfortunate. Let's move on. Oh, that's everything. Carl is waiting there. Mr. President, can I have a moment of your time? I have something to discuss. Of course, let's go inside the office. We entered my office. I went up to my desk and sat down on my chair. Please have a seat, Carl. Or I'm listening. The Secret State Police has compiled a report regarding the active investigations. We have been watching the oligarchs closely, just as you asked, and found a very complex web of connections. There are missing links in our investigations, but Marcel Karate and Walter Tuscan... Okay, so they're corrupt as shit. Currently, we're following a trail that leads to Estord, 
which might reveal some of their secrets. We have another suspicion. Our findings led us to believe that there might be some connections between the illegal arms trafficking in East Mercopa and the oligarchs. If we decide to proceed with our investigations, we can potentially uncover a lot more. Continue the efforts. Let's find some shit. Thank you, Carl. Ah, damn. Huh. Alright, what's in the news? Uh, Heavy water facility. So they're trying to make nukes in Rumberg. Yep. Gang violence diminished. That's good. Ura's... Okay, there's more protests. Yeah, that's to be expected. Address to the nation. Oh, man, this is going to suck. It was unusually crowded today. Are you ready, sir? Yes, let's do it. My fellow citizens. I'd like to speak about the events of the past months, about a great historic effort to give the words unity and hope new meaning and power. From the moment I was sworn in, I have done nothing but fight to achieve the change you demanded. Alas, my vision was too grand for the narrow scope of our current Supreme Court. I'm going to blame everything on them. The justices could not conceive of a swordland in which they weren't free to engage in corruption and bribery, knowing nobody could remove them from office. And so they spitefully acted against me, putting their own pettiness before the needs of this country. People of Swordland, Anton Rain will not let himself be so easily cowed. I have not given up my commitment to restore Swordland to glory. The future is in our hands. With or without the Assembly's support, there is no end to what we can achieve. Um, with reform now off the table, I shall keep following through my promise to improve Swordland's military. Thank you for standing by me, your president, both in good times and bad. And Morgan Thou West Corps, Victor and Sista. Well, shit. And continue. Revelations, oh lord. And turn, what are we on now? Turn seven. Awesome. And that actually seems like a good place to end it for tonight. Oh boy, that was a that was a blow to my plans. So I guess becoming a dictator, or at least more of a dictator than I already am, is off the table. So now it's all about vengeance against Rumberg, which is fine as long as they suffer. I call it a victory. Ah, all right. But even though the stream tonight is done, the streaming in general don't stop. Thanks so much for being here. But we'll of course be back. Not this Monday, because I'll be out of town on a brief vacation, but a week from Monday, we continue our Warhammer Total War playthrough. I've been playing as the Empire. Uh, I've our, our allies in the Blunderdome are playing as Bretonia, and it's been pretty crazy. I've had one of the worst starts ever in a Warhammer Total War II uh, campaign as, uh, as the Empire, but I'm slowly turning it around. On Wednesday... Not entirely sure what we're doing. Might continue the campaign of Hearts of Iron 4, although we're kind of near the end of that. I, I don't know. Or maybe some Star Citizen. That's been on the docket for a while. Who can say? Uh, and then a week today, more Suzerain to unleash vengeance against those monarchist bastards who I hate. But uh, before we end things for the night, let's raid somebody. Oh, Mortred Vikings kind of having a chill stream, so let's uh, let's do that. All right, so... Thanks again for being here tonight, folks, and uh, we'll uh, catch you next time as soon as this raid kicks off.